using a New Kingdom group writing orthography, and it's in a late Ramesside hand that shows some similarities to that of the scribe Inanna, which may be potentially interesting, although not so much to assume that it was written by him. Um, and the dates of the, of the text based on paleography are somewhere between the reigns of Merneptah and Ramses III. There is one Egyptian title accompanying the Kehek text on fragment recto D, column X plus four, line two, and it's highlighted here in red. This title reads, Er en hefa'u em jedden kehek, a spell for snakes in the speech of the kehek. From this, it is clear that the text records the kehek language. But to understand what the kehek language was linguistically, we must first look towards understanding who the kehek were historically. Attestations of the kehek appear relatively plentiful during the Ramesside period and reflect a narrative of the people's history that is much in keeping with the fates of many foreign groups in Egypt. It appears that the Kehek were first taken captive during the Libyan War of Merneptah, and then subsequently appeared as mercenary auxiliaries in the Egyptian army, aiding the Egyptian army in the satirical Papyrus Anastasi I. They parallel the Sheridan, a sea people, uh, in Papyrus Harris I, attesting their status as resettled captives under the employment of the Ramesside state during the reign of Ramses III. Gardiner addresses the Kehek uh, when he thinks that they were, were Libyans. Ever since Gardiner, many others have tried to address the Kehek and have suggested maybe that they're sea peoples. Colleen Manasseh, however, has convincingly demonstrated that they're Libyans in her text and in, in her work on the Libyan war. Um, where they're almost always associated in, in textual attestations with either the Meshwesh or the Libu, who are both Libyan groups, and never really alone with the Sea Peoples. Perhaps of more relevance to, to my work on this papyrus is an attestation of one Kehek word preserved in another Ramesside magical text, also from the Turin collection, Papyrus Turin CGT 54051. Um, and this word I will, I will address in a little bit. And also um, the, the attestation of the Kehek among other Libyan groups in the onomasticon of Amenemope, which gives more credence to a Libyan identification of the Kehek. So if we're pretty certain that the Kehek are Libyans, this brings to question what did ancient Libyans speak? Um, so more recent Egyptological inquiries into the language of the Libyans, particularly that of Frédéric Collin, um, have, have demonstrated that the language of the so-called Libyans who interacted with Egypt mainly during the first millennium BCE uh, is, is uh, potentially related to this inscriptional language attested in what is now Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco called Numidian, which appears indigenously uh, during the later half of the first millennium BCE, either in Tunisia or maybe in Morocco. Berberists are still not really sure. Um, the Berberists who have been working on the decipherment of Numidian for the better half of the last two centuries have continuously suggested that Numidian and Old Libyan as preserved in Egyptian records constitute their own subbranch of the Berber language family, itself a sister family to Egyptian and Semitic within Afroasiatic. So it's a logical supposition then to assume that Kehek, if it belongs to an old Libyan language family alongside Numidian and the other ancient Libico-Berber languages, will have approximately as great of a degree of linguistic commonality with modern Berber as these other uh, ancient Libyan languages. And for those of you who are, who are more unfamiliar with Afroasiatic linguistics, it's interesting to note that Berber or Libico-Berber languages, as we saw in, in the last talk a little bit, were quite closely related to both Egyptian and Semitic languages. And while they're severely understudied, future research into grammatical and lexical kinship among these branches could be quite fruitful. Um, and of course, this, this language tree is uh, very reductive of a much more diverse spectrum of related languages. Uh, comparison between Kehek, as it's preserved in this text, and Proto-Berber, if we can speak of it, is quite difficult, as the status of Proto-Berber remains debated among linguists, and it must be reconstructed through the comparative method drawn from the study of over 25 living Berber languages, indigenous to most of the rest of North Africa, including the Siwa Oasis in Egypt, uh, and the ancient and medieval inscriptional material. And the exploration of linguistic identities of ancient Libyan groups, particularly through the lens of Berber linguistics and philology, is part of my ongoing dissertation research. So returning to this papyrus, we can see that the text is sadly only fragment fragmentarily preserved, 
with most fragments attesting either the beginnings or ends of lines, and only fragment D on the far left in the image attesting a complete passage in Kehek. Previous work on the papyrus has thus focused primarily on this passage and has missed significant evidence for a Berber identification of the Kehek language that is attested on the other fragments. Beginning with the first and most complete fragment, the text exhibits a high degree of repetition, which can be expected given its magical nature. Of note is the only complete magical spell beginning with the Egyptian title on line two of column X plus four, uh, Er and Hefa'u, Emjed and Kehek, a spell for snakes in the speech of the Kehek. It is noteworthy that nearly every line of this spell following that title begins with the Kehek word Isemi, and you'll see it repeated in lines four through nine. Uh, and, it ne and nearly every line ends with the word rendered cha or mati. This pattern appears consistent throughout the entirety of the text, with the broken column X plus three attesting that same final word cha or mati uh, at least four and maybe seven times, depending on the reconstruction. Recto C, column X plus two, attests the beginnings of several lines of another spell. Uh, with about half of the lines beginning with that initial word, isami. The same situation is reflected in recto B, column X plus one. This fragment also interestingly may include a vignette of a rearing cobra to the right of the beginning of line four, uh, if you see on, on the heretic in the left. And then recto A, column X, uh, exhibits the same initial word, although very fragmentarily preserved, isemi. And so because of the repetition of these words, it's clear that they must be some sort of semantic unit in and of themselves. And other words in the text appear to have been demarcated by the T14 throw stick determinative, which is maybe used as a word divider in this text. And this has allowed me to conduct some lexical analysis on the text with some certainty as to where words begin and end. So before I could conduct lexical analysis, the first step I needed to take into analyzing and identifying the Kehek language is to assemble an inventory of all of the consonants present in this text, potentially all of those consonants that are present in the Kehek language. And this table shows all of the consonants that were written alongside their associated graphemes in the group writing orthography. And the most notable conclusion of this kind of assemblage of, of, of consonants is the absence of any pharyngeal, velar, or uvular fricatives. Those are sounds like ch, ein, or h, uh, which are ubiquitous in Semitic languages, but is also in Egyptian, though not thought to be present in, in reconstructions of Proto-Berber that have been recently proposed in 2020. Because they're not included in the Kehek phonological system, though, it's highly unlikely that Kehek is an unidentified Semitic language, as has been previously suggested. There are, however, some issues in Kehek phonemics. There are serious limitations imposed by the Egyptian orthography. Group writing doesn't really record vowels, as we're all familiar with. So data on vowels, which are quite important in Berber, uh, cannot really be, be worked with. And then there are some major issues in reconciling Proto-Berber phonemics with Kehek phonemics. Um, geminated consonants are not shown in group writing or in Egyptian writing at all and are quite significant in Berber languages. And the statuses of the P sound versus the F sound and the B sound and the H sound are not fully understood for Proto-Berber. Kehek attests P, B, and H. Um, and so there's some issues there. Um, though Kehek seems more in keeping with the results of some philological study of other varieties of ancient Berber. There's also limitations imposed by the projection of Proto-Berber phonemics onto the Kehek data. Um, Egyptological readings for graphemes like the hill sign, which we read in Egyptian as k, may belie several possible Proto-Berber phonemes, and it's really difficult to identify which one this, this grapheme is recording. It could be k, a k, r, g, a g, or a gu. And these are all also, not all of them, but a lot of them are attested in Semitic loan words. Um, and so the lexical identification process for Kehek is less methodol methodologically rigorous than it is for, say, a Semitic language. Um, and it's been mostly a process of trial and error. 
Proto-Berber is also not fully established with certainty, so there's that as a major issue. Um, and the results of reconstruction using the comparative method have been shown to be different from philological inquiries within Berber studies. So there's a lot of, a lot of room for, for improvement in Berber studies as well. But what can we actually say about Kehek given all of these limitations? So given the, the limitations imposed by the text orthography and our understanding of early phases of Berber, um, we can say something because we know that this is a spell for snakes. So it's accompanied by an Egyptian title, Arun Hefa'u Amjad and Kehek. And this title is also useful in light of that other papyrus that attests one Kehek word. It's given here as Wachaharma. Um, and this word is explicitly defined in the other magical text as hefa'u, snake, serpent, or worm. Um, and so because we know that wachaharma means snake, and we see this word, charmati, on the left, repeated about 15 times in our papyrus, which we know is a magical spell for the protection against snakes, and we see that charmati includes potentially a similar triliteral root, which are quite common in Berber, to wachaharma, we can conclude that the root cheram might have something to do with snakes. And upon further analysis of this in light of, of Marwan Kalani's recent publication, which shows that, that the cha sign can be read as a z in Semitic language uh, loan words, we see that the root zeram is likely attested here. Zeram is attested in all of Northern Berber with the meaning of snake, serpent, or worm, or eel, or a bunch of other reptiles, but most, most commonly snake. If you're wondering, these additional affixes can be explained through Berber grammar. Um, the, the wa prefix is a Berber article, the, for the masculine, and the t suffix is likely a Berber feminine suffix attested entirely in every Berber language, or potentially the d sound, which is a deictic, meaning this, so this snake. Following this, I was able to identify many different morphological and, and lexical Parallels, there's way too much for you guys to read on this slide, um, but a lot of them are quite interesting as they have to do with snakes, um, including the verb yashadau, attested in one of the, the verses in the snake spell, which is likely an attestation of the Berber root shud, which means to slither, um, as well as the verbs to eat, sh, and to kill, nuh, uh, which are expected in a magical text. There is something that can be said a little bit about Kehek syntax because this word zarmat or charamati is attested line finally, it's highly unlikely uh, that, that the language is, uh, the, the word order is verb final because this is a noun. So the, the word order of this language is likely subject verb object or verb subject object, both of which are attested word orders in Berber languages. If we take the idea that it could be a verb subject object language uh, and, and we look into the initial words of, of each line, each of them do show large correspondences with the Berber uh, verbal morphology. And so of the initial words in the Kehek, the Berber verb forms highlighted in red are attested among those, those initial words. So to conclude, how can we categorize the Kehek language? Well, first of all, it's likely not Semitic because there's no uvular, velar, or pharyngeal fricatives, and it's a quite long test, text, so we would, we would expect those. Second of all, we, we see that it shows strong affinities on a morphological and lexical level with Berber languages. Um, and the Libyan origin of the Kehek further strengthens the likelihood of an identification of the Kehek language with some ancient branch of the Berber family. And so this brings up into question some interesting implications. Um, indigenous Libyan religion is not well understood archaeologically or textually, largely owing to the inability to dig in the modern nation state of Libya in recent years and also the lack of indigenous texts. Uh, but the little that is known seems to suggest that snakes were of some religious importance to Libyans, attested by serpentine iconography and statuary and ritual objects from the Greco-Roman period, as well as a very interesting gigantic snake carved in the Libyan cave sanctuary at Slonta near Benghazi, shown on the right. Um, furthermore, for Berberists, this text marks a very interesting um, discovery as it likely pushes back our earliest date of a Berber language. The current record is held by the Numidian Punic bilingual dedication inscription of King Mekipsa or Mekiusan in Numidian 
from either 138 BC or 146 BC, depending on whose chronology you follow, found at Dugga in Tunisia. Uh, this inscription from Morocco, from the site of Azib Nikis in Adrar Niagur, may potentially be older, may potentially be older, though we don't really know. Regardless, they're both late first millennium, and if this text dates to the reign of Merneptah or Ramses III, it's nearly a thousand years earlier. Thank you. Uh, before, before I conclude, I'd like to, since it's being recorded, I would like to say a word of thanks to some of my colleagues, particularly those in Morocco who taught me Berber, and pardon my Berber, but I'd like to thank them in their native language. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>What a cool text. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Uh, we have time for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I know nothing about Berbers, <laughs> so I would ask, but um, is it possible that the um, final position of that word is some kind of vocative, or is that just not a text? Yeah, I thought about that actually, and it is possible. It's really frustrating because the vocative in Berber and Pan-Berber is usually attested just with the A vowel. You say like, A, C, D, like, oh, sir. Um, and so it's possible, but the vocative wouldn't be written using group writing orthography. Um, it's, it's very frustrating that we don't have vowels, for sure, yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my question is actually about perhaps the relationship between the, the text that you're talking about and a text at a very, very different time and context. Um, I'm thinking the, the pyramid text, the servant spells in a some type of early Semitic language, which are also for serpents. Hmm. Um, is there any, do you see any kind of connection here? Like, you know, of course now I'm thinking like a, kind of a parcel tongue uh, situation. Yeah. Like, obviously that's a joke, but like, is there any connection, like, Right, and so that's something that's been suggested before a little bit in the literature, and it's never really explicitly stated, but it's hinted at that like, oh, Berber might sound like a snake language because there aren't many vowels and it has all of these fricatives that sound like parcel tongue for lack of a better term. Um, I don't think it's likely. I think maybe we see a connection between foreignness and snakes and magic because it's a foreign entity that's connected to the danger of snakes. Um, through the Egyptian magical ideology. I think that's maybe more likely than, than this kind of phonological argument. But yeah, it's an interesting possibility, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I noticed on uh, Tarmaki that the ending was rustic, uh, although it didn't help if it was a snake. Uh, are there any metatextual or metatextual additions to the text that give you clues? There aren't that give me good clues. There's a couple enigmatic ones. We see seated men kind of sprinkled throughout the text. If you see, Charamati usually ends with the seated man too, um, which is a little bit strange. And I think it's just the scribe trying to show that it's a foreign word. Um, I don't think it's really anything more than that. Yeah, but it would be nice if there were. <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think if it's if it's yeah, it's interesting that it's written in Heratic. Uh, whether or not the scribe spoke Kehek is something I've done a lot of thinking about, and I'm still not entirely sure if he's just transcribing from a Kehek speaker or if he actually was engaging with it himself. The fact that he's putting determinatives in between words that have kind of logical word breaks within the Berber grammar understanding of the Kehek leads me to believe that he did speak Kehek. Um, also the fact that the verso of the papyrus contains Egyptian magical spells and that this is a magical spell makes me think that it was probably a very well-educated multilingual scribe who wrote the text, although there's no way to tell for certain. And unfortunately, it's so fragmentary that it's difficult to say much else. Yeah, thank you. We need to find more of this. <laughs>
I have not, but I would love to. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hmm. In the Greek, in the ancient Greek lore and religion and such, and so there's a, there's a all snaky. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, many of the every almost every major sculpture of Athena uh, has her covered with serpents coming off of her off of the aegis or off of her sleeves, like fringe and such. So. Uh, I know it doesn't bear directly on what you're doing, but what you're doing may end up bearing directly on something else in the ancient Mediterranean world. Yeah, thank you. It's filled with intriguing possibilities. Libya is super understudied and very, very has a lot of potential for, for future avenues of research. Anything else? Thank you. Please join me in thanking Jason Silvestri.